Now we discuss policy and what the main industrial policy might be to enhance uh, and strengthen competitiveness uh, and resiliency in the manufacturing sectors globally. I welcome Pierre Gattas, who's president of Business Europe. Uh, welcome Hello. to our panelists. Hello. Hello. Welcome back to Hello. WMF. Stefano Pan, who's Thank delegate you. of the president of Confindustria for Europe relations with other European Entrepreneurial Association. And then we have Lucilla Scioli, who's director for artificial intelligence and digital industry at the Directorate General Connect of the European Commission. Thank you all for your time for joining WMF. Let me start with Pierre Gattaz. In, uh, in your role, you oversee what's the real feeling of all sizes of, of industries facing COVID-19, not just the first, but also the second wave. So we know that there's a slowdown. We had kind of a recovery or a rebound more properly during Q3. Now, again, there are signs of a slowdown. So looking ahead, what's your sense of what the economy will do in terms of what's the shape? I know it's really difficult to, to tell, but what's the shape that the recovery will have? And what's the role that manufacturing will play in restoring the economy? Okay, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I would like to congratulate uh, President Bonomi and Kofi Tonsuria to organize this meeting. It's a virtual meeting, uh, unfortunately, but uh, uh, well, it's very good that we can uh, still uh, debate. Um, well, the, the shape, we don't know. I, I, would, I would guess it would be a W uh, shape. Why? Because, uh, of course, we have a big fall in summer, in spring. Uh, and uh, we thought the economy would uh, recover during the summer. And now, you know, it's weak again because of this second wave. So uh, we, we expect in our economic outlook uh, from Business Europe, by the way, a good report that I would like uh, to advise you to read or to, to analyze. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we expected uh, a fall by 7.3% in 2020 and uh, followed by a growth of 5% in 2021. But at the end of 2021, last quarter, we shouldn't reach again, uh, unfortunately not, the, the level of 2019. So you see that uh, we are in a, in a very severe crisis, as you all know, uh, can be long, uh, uneven, and uh, there's some uncertainty on uh, what, uh, what is going to, to, to happen. But on the other side, we have to be optimistic. Uh, because first of all, we are entrepreneur. Entrepreneur are optimistic, you know, enthusiastic. We know that the, 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 the crisis will be over. We know there are, there are some vaccine which will come, maybe mm -hmm. in six months, nine months. So um, the, the fact is, uh, in every crisis like that, uh, crisis means danger, but it means opportunities. So opportunities to accelerate in the digital industry, opportunities to accelerate in the industry, opportunities to build a stronger, and a more unified Europe. So what I see as the president of Business Europe, I see, uh, of course, uh, a lot of uh, problems, especially with SMEs. You know, my, my big concern right mm -hmm. now is the short-term conditions for our hotels, uh, catering guys, commerce, uh, mm -hmm. and, and SMEs. So they, are, they suffer and they might suffer even more. But uh, uh, so we have to very much take care of those guys, those companies for the short term. But then, of course, we have to build for the future. And that will be certainly the debate of today in this session. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are absolutely right. And we know that one of the elements that makes this crisis different and unknown versus all the crisis in the past is the fact that it is absolutely selective, that the service sector from travel to hospitality are the most badly better from the crisis, but other sectors, including some sectors of the manufacturing industries, they re reacted decently well. During, if we look at the numbers of Q3, for example, Pierre Gattaz, it showed some resiliency. And how do you see also the fact that exports is still living and China is still working as a market. And so uh, can you see any sign of optimism that you were saying before, also in some numbers that are coming out from the manufacturing sectors? Yes, of course. I, well, unfortunately, the, the link and the network is not so good. So I, I pick up your question. Uh, of course, you have uh, China, which is recovering very uh, quickly, and they have a, a growth of uh, plus 2%, uh, I think, this year in 2020. And they are anticipating a growth of uh, 
plus five, I think, next year. So, um, so uh, you see, um, uh, there are uh, continents, there are uh, member states which are behaving better when we look at uh, maybe Germany, uh, Austria, some, some uh, are a strong economy. They have a strong industry too. And um, uh, so, you know, um, uh, we should take uh, the observation of the best practice among us. So some sectors are very much it affected, some others are still doing well. And if you talk about the digital industry, of course, everybody is at home or in, uh, you know, uh, uh, remote uh, work and they use, you know, all platforms, services, digital mm -hmm. services. And so this is a, a lesson too to take from the crisis, you know. Uh, so it's just to evaluate and to adapt. So uh, my message here is, of course, there's a lot of danger with this crisis, but it's, um, it's a way, it's a, it's a big opportunity for all companies to, to adapt, and digital is one of the solutions. Um, and we need to be creative to find other way to make business, you know. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it has already be, been rem reminded today that people, companies, economies, government changes when there's an urge to change, and this is exactly the case. Now, Stefano Pan, let me move also to you, and you know very well the Italian situation of the industry. Let's start with the short-term view, because we know that the second wave of the pandemic is slowing down the recovery. What, is, what will it take okay to survive and to look beyond what's happening for the manufacturing sector thank you very much for the invitation uh, it's a pleasure to be here to discuss, to discuss with you uh, the new world we're facing um, <clears throat> regarding the Italian situation uh, it's uh, even Worse, uh, Pierre Gattas uh, uh, made a very precise description on the European outview. In Italy, uh, we expect a uh, fall in GDP uh, between 11 and 12 percent. We see that trust is lacking, uh, private savings are going up uh, by 18 percent. That's a sign that people are afraid that they don't uh, spend money. And uh, we have really many, many companies, as Pierre Gatta said, especially the SMEs that are really suffering and uh, they, need, they need a sustain. Uh, it's a crisis. And uh, uh, as Alberto Ribola, the president of uh, the World Manufacturing uh, Foundation, uh, put it, uh, he put a very strong point. It's about ideas, it's about politicians, and it's about how we are able, we are part of the solution, how we are able to transmit to people that um, um, there are solutions, that there are approaches that can help. Uh, we had already a difficult year when we entered 2020. We had uh, global uh, challenges, uh, the global warming, uh, we had uh, the reshoring uh, in, uh, in some parts, uh, we had trade wars that were very uh, strong. And then the pandemic came. And the pandemic um, provoked a, really a deep shock. And uh, for the first time in, in history, in, or in the last decades, we had a very strong response from Europe. Um, and uh, even in the name, how it's called, uh, the, the first response was called recovery. And then it was changed to a new world, to the new generation, uh, EU. And this implies already the, uh, the depth of uh, what we see in front of us. It's not a short-term uh, question. It's something that we have to um, face for the next generations. We are facing a completely reshape of our country, of Europe, and possibly of the world. Mm -hmm. And within this reshaping, manufacturing, the new manufacturing plays a central role. And uh, the new generation, new program, um, is based on, uh, is a reaction exactly on, on this challenge. Uh, it's based on uh, the New Deal. How can we reshape, rework, remodelize our uh, way of, of working, uh, taking out the, the carbon uh, footprint, mm -hmm. making it smaller? The, the, uh, so the car, the, the uh, and, and as well the, the digital challenge. Uh, these are the two main pillars, New Green Deal and the Digital Deal that we have to bring mm -hmm. on. We have all to do um, um, a 
double work in our nations. There we have to convince and, and uh, our politicians, explain very well to our politicians that those things are can only be achieved by other two columns, by investments, triggering private uh, investments and public investments in one side and doing reforms. We, especially in Italy, can, uh, we know we can uh, add uh, six points of our GNP only by reorganizing public administration and the, just, yeah. the, and the justice. And uh, this is a enormous driver we can, uh, we can uh, um, uh, let happen. And this is as well uh, as what Confindustria Carlo Bologna, uh, he will speak uh, after us, um, uh, put into towards the courage of the future. We have the solutions, we have to explain them very well, and then we have to go into step by step explaining and, and uh, transmitting yeah. the enthusiasm that even in the deepest crisis, there are this, there's a light in the end of the tunnel, and we have to go that way very directly. Mm -hmm. Well, in a nutshell, Stefano Pana, I know I read that you were cons concerned about disagreement uh, among European governments and slowing down the road to the recovery fund and next generation EU. How do you feel about the deal that has been just reached on the European balance and uh, apparently it's a green light to move a next step forward? I think, uh, to be uh, honest, we have to uh, wait another few days to understand uh, how the Visegrad states will really uh, behave. On uh, 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 There's one thing, Business Europe uh, uh, made it very clear. Uh, last week, uh, the three biggest uh, industrial nations, uh, uh, associations of the industrial nations, Confindustria, together with Medef, and uh, the German association met, um, uh, pushing on the ideas of Business Europe especially this way, we need fast action. We need to the last mile to be done. The response of Europe has been wonderful this time. And uh, even in the, uh, in the people's uh, perception, uh, there's the first time that uh, it was uh, very uh, appreciated that Europe reacted. The July statement was a very strong statement. And now we, we have this, uh, this uh, uh, working on uh, the, 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 the fight on the uh, QFP, um, uh, we, we, but I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that within a few days we will have very good news and we will uh, uh, be able to really start, to start really the program we have to face all together. Now, Lucilla Scioli, there might be some adjustment in terms of timing of these programs, but for sure, investing in technology, digitization of our economy will be at the center of the recovery plan of the European Union. So please help us understanding what's the main ideas and projects you do have to make accessible technology to SMEs and to leverage on artificial intelligence to reboost the European economy. I'm afraid you're on mute. Apologies. Okay. Good afternoon. Here we go. First, uh, let me just remind that this agreement that was reached yesterday uh, on, uh, on the next generation EU is extremely important because on the one hand, with the recovery fund, it gives means to member states to invest in projects. And uh, the council agreed that 20% of this investment has to be in digital. So this is very important. If you think that Italy um, probably receives uh, around 200 million euros, you think that 20% has to be invested in, in digital. I really hope it does make the digital transformation of, of the country. Um, uh, we, of course, at the European Commission, we, we are supporting this process uh, because the, the, the member states prepare national reform programs. You read that in the news every day. Uh, so they will come forward with projects that we will assess um, at the European Commission. Um, uh, and so we look forward to seeing exactly what kind of projects are being put forward in digital. We support very much not only uh, Industry 4.0 projects and all projects that can support manufacturing and, and industrial sectors, but also technological projects. This money can be used for projects of common European interest. It can be used for large projects in microelectronics, 
cloud high performance computing. So we really expect and hope that member states will make sensible plans in this sense. And secondly, there is a multi-annual financial framework with Horizon Europe, which is a research program. And we have a new program called the Digital Europe program. Now with the Digital Europe program, we are financing a network of digital innovation hubs. And these hubs, and we hope that they're very well spread across the territory, uh, will help small medium enterprise to digitize, in particular for artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and having access to supercomputing resources. So we are betting a lot on artificial intelligence. And when we bet on artificial intelligence and its transformative power and as a driver really of a transformation of the manufacturing industry, we heard that before as well in the previous session, we also know that we need to be able to access large amounts of data. Now, this is really a challenge. Uh, in Europe, we have a wealth of industrial data which can give us a competitive advantage compared to other parts of the world because you know when we talk about other parts of the world being more advanced in AI it's mostly because of consumer data but when it comes to industrial data I think Europe does not stand behind anybody and that is really a comparative advantage that we have to learn to exploit because if we can really use AI in our manufacturing sector in our industrial sectors that's where we can become strong and leaders relative to other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, we have carried out a, a survey of enterprises and 65% of them told us that uh, um, one of the main barriers they have to the use of AI is the lack of trust. So they're afraid of either using AI themselves or putting it in their products because it may not be used because the use of, you know, artificial intelligence is a great technology with a lot of benefits but it's a little bit complex and opaque and unpredictable. And so there are concerns that it may not be safe or that it may not you know, it may discriminate or it may violate mm -hmm. other fundamental rights. So in the, the commission is preparing a framework for trust in artificial intelligence and it's a legislative approach that we are preparing and that we will publish at the beginning of next year. Yeah, that's very interesting. I've got a couple of more questions, but first, I move back to Pierre Gattaz to understand, from your standpoint, what are the main suggestions that from the industrialists in Europe can come to the government to, uh, to try to find some guidelines that are the most effective to relaunch manufacturing <coughs> and the economy as a whole? Yes, I've got uh, five, uh, five advice, five recommendations for the policymakers. Uh, the first one is very important, is we need to keep supporting the business and workers. That's very important. No more tax, no additional tax, no additional constraints. We need to be sure that policymakers will, uh, will do things which, uh, for the competitiveness of, of the business and of the companies and the survival of the company. Second thing, second recommendation will be that we need to support investment. Investment is a key, so we need that our policymakers support uh, overall investment levels. And in particular, we need rapid agreement and implementation of the EU next generation uh, EU recovery instrument, which is essential. As uh, Stefan Pan said, this is historical. Uh, we, there's a lot of money on the table, European money on the table, and we absolutely need to be sure that this money will, of course, be used for survival, but not only, and especially for new investments, for new growth, for, um, um, for jobs, creation in the future. Third recommendation would be that um, to be very careful about the transposition of the Basel III agreement, because we are very worried in business Europe and in the business community that uh, the future changes to capital requirements uh, following the transposition of the last Basel agreement will increase financing costs for the EU companies, EU firms. So therefore, we call for any changes regarding the regular, regulatory requirements for bank capital to be carefully calibrated to ensure they do not lead to a sudden reduction in lending and investment. That's very important because if we weaken the banking system of Europe, you understand that the, the full economy will be down. Are so you be concerned very careful. of a credit crunch? Are you f fearing that it is, it is going to happen? 
Uh, yes, if the Basel uh, three, uh, uh, I would say, agreement is is modified in a in a bad uh, in a bad way, you know, people and the business and especially SMEs are looking for money for cash to survive. So if the banks have some more constraints, uh, that's uh, going to be uh, not a good mm -hmm. news for yeah. for the world economy. So this is my third recommendation: is very to be very careful about this uh, mm -hmm. transposition of this Basel three. And uh, last, uh, uh, not last, there's mm -hmm. a Brexit, of course, we absolutely need to complete the EU-UK negotiations. Following the latest developments of the negotiations, you understand that it's uh, very imperative that the both sides remain committed to do everything they can in the weeks ahead to deliver an agreement that provides a sound competitive environment for our companies, for the business, combining good market access with a st strong level playing field. And last but not least, support the SMEs again with uh, concrete money. Again, you know, there's a lot of money on the table, on the clouds somewhere, <laughs> um, and the SMEs are just dying. So uh, can we have a telephone number, you know, to call Europe and say, okay, I need some money. No, I'm just kidding. The, the idea is really that this big money can go down to the bottom, to sure. the field, in order that we can save uh, a lot of SMEs on the field, mm -hmm. which has which are suffering. Well, yeah, that's for sure. The only money that we've seen are money from the central bank that's continuously buying bonds from government. So that's real money that's already circulating. But we'll get back in a minute to that. Stefano Pan, are, do, you have, do you share the same concerns and would you sign on the five recommendation of Piergataz? Yeah, I, I agree with him. The credit crunch uh, is a risk and we have to take care that uh, uh, we are able to um, bridge this critical period. And uh, we don't know how long this critical period will be. Probably it will be uh, until next summer. The very good news of the uh, just uh, of yesterday uh, regarding the uh, a remedy against the pandemic um, spread a lot of hope. Um, the, uh, aspect that is emerging uh, in this uh, um, crisis is uh, very positive. It's, I think, a quantum leap we are experiencing, experiencing because for the first time European companies and European um, uh, nations do really work together and to really start to think how we build uh, European champions how we build, we go into the interest uh, projects of uh, uh, common European interest, how we build uh, um, a frame where we all feel really in a common house and in a spirit that is not exclusive. exclusive. It's not um, a muscular approach, it's a, an approach that is more a best practice that can be, can be Copied on in the rest of the globe, and this is, I think, one of the most um, of the strongest ideas Europe and European identity can uh, bring out. Um, the idea that we are able to put together essentials, um, like Lucia uh, Lu said before, um, uh, a, 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 a secure cyber space, um, a strong investment in uh, digital framework. Um, enabling SMEs to work together with bigger companies to create uh, new value chains that are really uh, strengthening uh, everybody. Um, uh, going into um, an approach that goes away from trade wars uh, and uh, um, enables to go back to free trade agreements that brings the whole globe together. This is creating value. This is creating um, um, uh, richness that can be spread to the next generation. This is what can create jobs for the young generation that they really can believe in. Uh, much more intelligent uh, uh, working opportunities, much more connected, much with, with, with much more skill. And this is something we have to tell the teachers, we have to tell the schools, we have to tell the, 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 the people. Uh, this can really uh, uh, even Though there is a, a pandemic, this can really um, 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 
let a new spirit go through Europe and with Europe uh, throughout the world for, for uh, having solutions for the global, global questions. Uh, the manufacturing, intelligent manufacturing and new manufacturing is really part of the solution mm -hmm. and can um, give enormous, enormous, uh, uh, be an enormous driver in, in whatever we do, we do, creating a new policy, creating a new system, creating a new surrounding where we feel very comfortable in and where we all can give the yeah. best of our. Of ourselves. Well, well, Our Stefano Pan, we, we need to revamp the economy, we need to make the economy more inclusive, especially during a crisis time like this, but also more competitive at the global level. Investing in a more digital economy in Europe will be for sure the key. But Lucilla Scioli, you were mentioning before that Europe could lead the game in terms of industrial artificial intelligence. Now, seen from the outside, when we talk artificial intelligence, we know that we depend on American platform. The platform economy was born in the Silicon Valley, but China invested heavily in the last decade. And now they do have kind of a nearly a billion users with a smartphone. They do have a large data pool that they can use to develop uh, artificial intelligence. They do not have the troubles with 5G we are experiencing in terms of supplying. They're working already on 6G. How can Europe uh, expect to become a real player in the future of artificial intelligence, also from an industrial standpoint? Again, I'm afraid that you're on mute, you're silent. Sorry. <laughs> I'm afraid that Europe, Europe is, is very strong in industrial sectors, like manufacturing, like automotive, like um, mm -hmm. aerospace. Okay, maybe nowadays uh, this is not a great example, but we are in healthcare, we, we are um, strong in the, the development of, of uh, processes and products. Um, that belong more to the traditional sectors than to the world of the, the big, large uh, platforms, although we do have some platform ourselves. Eh? Um, so I think, because many people ask me, how can you think uh, Europe can ever be competitive in AI? Because we talk about AI, we always talk about the states and China. And the first answer is exactly that we can become strong in the industrial sectors if our industrial sectors embrace the AI revolution deploy AI, use AI uh, in a factory, AI, edge AI can really change the way a factory works. And we may have been a little bit later in 5G than other parts of the world, but we are there and we are also preparing for 6G. Eh? Mm -hmm. um, what we have on top of that that is different from other parts of the world is that we want to develop technology the European way. So we have some values in the European Union. Think of our commitment to the green objectives or think of our commitment to privacy, to security. We cannot necessarily bet on depending on uh, non-European technology, um, on some mm -hmm. key non-European technologies in the future. So we have to become much better and capable of developing key technology that has these characteristics ourselves. I'm not saying that, and this is the concept of technological autonomy, that you hear a lot nowadays in Europe. It's not about becoming autarchic or not importing uh, um, and being a sole player. It's only about having the possibility to be able to develop a technology with characteristics that we choose, not to have to depend on the characteristics in terms of energy efficiency or of security that are developed elsewhere. And this applies to artificial intelligence as well as it can apply to I don't know, chips in microelectronics or even to, to supercomputers or even to the cloud. So I think this idea of doing things the European way can be very powerful for the future of digital technologies and digital industry in the European Union. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And I've got a couple of questions from the audience for you. The first one is, do we have, do we have in Europe enough skilled resources for digital AI? And the second one is, can you give us some example of what your directorate is doing to let SMEs access artificial intelligence? In terms of skills, look, the European Union has got skills. We have 
one of the best education systems in the world, we have two problems. The first one is that sometimes the best talent leaves because we are not able to offer sufficiently good working conditions or interesting conditions for this talent. And the second problem we have, and that everybody has done, not just European Union, is that the digital transformation is very fast and we don't have enough students that undertake these studies. Now to this problem, one solution is to really engage in pushing our female, our lady students to undertake these studies because we really have a gap. They are not undertaking these studies and if they did, that would be a very important pool of talent that we could, you know, that could really help in terms of skills uh, in our digital economy. But to do that, you have to start teaching programming early in school, attracting girls to this kind of studies. And so there is quite a lot to do. There are some Italian regions that do very good work from this point of view. So I think it's just a matter of time um, and of uh, raising awareness and making sure that programming in any case is taught into all the faculties if you, in economics. Economists have to be able to program. And one day they may work with AI. They may not have to program the AI, but they will understand it. Same for doctors, same for um, lawyers. Uh, so I think that there is, you know, through um, uh, uh, multidisciplinary approaches, we can really also reach much more digital competencies in, in AI. And what do we do in my directorate to help SMEs? As I said, we uh, support a network of digital innovation hubs. These are co-founded with the member states. Uh, next year, we will have the first network of hubs uh, and they will help SMEs to, 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 to innovate, to test before invest, to have access to financial resources, either European mm -hmm. resources or uh, other kind of financial resources, and also access to skills. And, uh, and some of these hubs will be specialized in artificial intelligence. Uh, we also support another project that we call uh, um, the AI on Demand project. This is a big platform that will carry resources for artificial intelligence that will be available for SMEs for free. Oh, thank you for that. Pierre Gattaz, uh, uh, we know that the EU had an ambitious target having 20% of the output, the GDP, from the manufacturing sector in 2020. Now, we struggled to get there, but in the spring was presented a new industrial framework, a new industrial policy from the United, from, uh, European Union. Uh, given what pandemic means for this sector, is that still adequate? And what do you suggest? Yes, I think it's uh, very adequate. I think we, Europe needs a very strong uh, uh, industrial strategy, and they have decided one in March, February or March. They have, uh, with the current economic situations, because of the COVID uh, crisis, uh, they have started some adjustments uh, of priorities, and we very much push on, on that. Uh, I think uh, we, we have. Um, I think we, we, we have to. Uh, to redo, uh, to upgrade, to update uh, this industrial strategy uh, with uh, five key principles that I'm going to explain to you. The first key principle is that the Green Deal, which is one of the topic, main topic of this industrial strategy, must be an opportunity for growth, an opportunity for jobs, uh, for uh, well-being of the people. So, of course, we absolutely need to mobilize investments to, uh, to become metal in a cohesive way. Uh, and we need to ensure enough affordable green energy and improve the global playing field regarding carbon emissions reductions. What I'm saying is that we should transform uh, this Green Deal in, in economic opportunities and not in taxations, constraints, burdens, and so on and so on. So uh, the Green Deal must really be seen as a very interesting market uh, for, for all of us. Second thing, second key principle, we need to support the digital trans transformation for economies. And uh, this can only happen by creating the conditions of a safe deplo deployment of new te technologies, such as, as Lucilla uh, explained, uh, artificial intelligence, 5G, of course, as well as for the industrial data economy. And uh, we need to develop skills that's so important for Europe. And uh, of course, by uh, uh, promoting uh, voluntary data sharing through common European data space. That means that we need absolutely to know where our data, 
will go, uh, protect our data, and uh, be sure that uh, they stay in Europe the more, the more we can. Third, we need a timeline, a calendar for restoring all single market freedoms of movements to pre-COVID conditions. Uh, but, uh, of course, that means that we should further open the service markets, that we stop we should stop the intervention of the Commission in the standardization process, which usually has been a kind of bottom-up process from the company. So now more and more we see weeks, we see uh, fears of having a standardization proce process which comes from the institution, from uh, uh, like a top-down process. So uh, we, we are a bit, um, uh, a bit uh, alarmed about that. And of course, make public procurement more efficient, less complex and more cross-border uh, for, for the single market. Mm -hmm. Fourth, we need uh, an ambitious trade agenda to promote new trade and investment opportunities for our companies. And especially, we need uh, the reform of the WTO because, as you know, we want to export. Europe is there to promote, to export their product. So we are very much against protectionism. But uh, if we want to export, we need to have rules of the games. And uh, we are very much in favor of uh, agreements and of course of uh, the WTO, which must be uh, uh, the kind of police of, of this trade uh, uh, organization. And uh, we need, of course, to, put, to push a smart technological sovereignty of Europe. You know, all big continents, China, United States, have their own technological sovereignty. So Europe shouldn't be naive. We absolutely need a technological sovereignty. Uh, so we are pushing that, promoting that again, in a very open-minded, in a very uh, exportation-minded, partnership-minded, uh, but we need to, to develop that. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, of course, SMEs uh, m that must be taken into account in this, uh, in this industrial strategy, because the risk of this industrial strategy is that we care only on the large, big companies, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and we absolutely need to develop ecosystems to be sure that the SMEs are, are part of this industrial mm -hmm. strategy. Now, Stefano Pan, what's your takeaway, also given that your work with Confindustria is to uh, communicate a dialogue with other industrialist associations around Europe? Do you think that there's a convergence of interest or national interest and competition will continue to influence your relations? We uh, are team players, and uh, especially in this crisis, we experience within business Europe, within the bilateral um, meetings we have that we have one common goal and we can only win all together. We, we, we take it all or, or we are out. This is a very strong spirit, a new spirit that I experience in the intensity I never did before and uh, this uh, makes me uh, uh, fills me with a, a lot of positiveness. Um, uh, we are strong on it and uh, I believe that uh, Europe has an enormous team um, that does not play alone, but is ready to play a global play altogether. Back to Lucilla Scioli for a couple of questions, because first, uh, Pierre Gattaz was mentioning standardization and the process, top-down, bottom-up. What do you make of that? And secondly, AI. I mean, we all know that AI is underway transforming all industrial sectors, not just manufacturing, will be the key in the future. At the same time, the job market is going through the deepest crisis after the Second World War, and many are concerned that the impact of AI will be more automation, less job in the future. How would you see the evolution of an AI that can be helpful to create more jobs, different jobs, high quality jobs, instead of just cutting jobs and leaving people outside of the you know, offices and work plans? On standardization, first, I, I agree to the statement that standardization should not be top down. Um, on the other hand, sometimes uh, standardization starts from the activity of companies but sometimes these activities may not be fast enough. You know, for us, uh, standardization is important because we have a European legislation where when European standards exist, 
this may significantly reduce the cost uh, for for companies that produce uh, for example risky products and have to go through conformity assessment if they can use a standard that reduces the cost extensively and so we think uh, the standards are very important for our small medium enterprises but then sometimes it's true that we do intervene because we want to accelerate the process because the process sometimes is not fast enough and uh, also when it takes place in an international context we also want to make sure that there is enough european representation in the standardization process um, for what concerns the, the job market and the impact of automation and, and AI on jobs, um, uh, I don't think uh, there is any statistic yet uh, that there is any real evidence that uh, artificial intelligence is actually um, you know, replacing jobs. Uh, it's true that it can um, do some things that humans do much better than humans or faster than humans. But most of the time, this will still require some kind of human oversight. So uh, I don't think that jobs will be lost. I think that jobs will change. We change, we require probably different skills. Um, uh, but um, I will just give you an example. For example, now during the pandemic, uh, radiologists were using artificial intelligence systems that can read the CT scans of lungs and tell very quickly whether a patient has COVID and, and how infected she is. Um, none of them has ever complained of the fact that this artificial intelligence system could replace the radiologist. Mm -hmm. Also because the system is used to advise a radiologist and then it's a radiologist that takes the final decision. So if the machines and the systems are used as such, there is not really uh, a problem. The problem of automation is very much on the routine jobs. Uh, uh, but that's technological change, and that technological change has existed for hundreds of years, and I don't think it's anything more specific to AI than to, to anything else. So my answer to that is there is no evidence that AI is impacting negatively on the labor market, and for the moment it's mostly mm -hmm. speculation, and I personally do not believe in that. Yeah, that's a crucial point looking at the future, and it, there's a large debate on the way. So thanks again to Lucila Scioli from the Directorate General Connect of the European Commission. And Cora Grazia, thanks to Pierre Gattaz and Stefano Pan for joining the conversation of the World Manufacturing Forum. Thanks.